Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's webinar of the Lifestyle Medicine Series, Staying Connected, Healthy, and Energized During COVID-19 and Beyond. My name is Yael Khan, and I'm a Clinical Research Coordinator in the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic. The Lifestyle Medicine Clinic at the MGH Cancer Center is focused on providing cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers with tailored recommendations for improving your physical fitness, nutrition, quality of life, or cancer prognosis. Our team is thrilled to be able to connect with you all virtually over the past few weeks. In tonight's session, we will present the science behind stress and its impact on chronic health and tools for reducing your response to stress. We will demonstrate a variety of mind-body techniques, including self-acupressure, mindful breathing, and movement. It is my pleasure to introduce our three panelists for this evening. Internist, Dr. Shalu Ramchandani, oncology nurse practitioner, Lauren Winters, and acupuncturist, Nathan Langford. Shalu Ramchandani is an internist specializing in obesity medicine. During her 20-year career in primary care, she has focused on lifestyle medicine to help patients improve their overall well-being. She is also certified as a health and wellness coach and a culinary coach. Apart from her private practice focusing on weight management, she is on faculty at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at MGH. Our next panelist tonight is Lauren Winters, an oncology nurse practitioner in the, and the assistant director for breast cancer survivorship at the MGH Cancer Center, Waltham. Her interests include lifestyle medicine and the use of integrative therapies for self-care. Lauren is also an outdoor sports enthusiast, a registered yoga teacher, and an Ayurvedic health counselor. Our final panelist tonight is Nate Langford, a licensed acupuncturist in the Catherine A. Gallagher Integrative Therapies Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital. As part of the Integrative Therapies team, he specializes in supporting chemotherapy and radiation therapies with acupuncture, helping patients manage side effects of care, improve quality of life, and support overall stress management. He also serves as a pediatric acupuncturist at the hospital, offering care to children with oncology diagnoses, cystic fibrosis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, post-surgical recovery, and sickle cell anemia pain concern. He brings a decade of teaching at the New England School of Art Acupuncture to MGH, currently precepting acupuncture interns in a specialized clinic for our staff and clinicians within the Cancer Center. Please note that during this presentation, you will be on mute, but there will be opportunities to ask questions um, at the second half of our session. Please see the Q&A button um, to ask, to post your questions. And without further ado, I'll pass it off to my colleagues. Thank you, Yael, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm Shalu Ramchandani. I am thrilled to be here tonight uh, in this webinar series. And I'm hoping that we're going to provide uh, some self-care tools for you. It certainly has been a challenging time for all of us. Um, so next. Um, so, um, like I said, we're going to be reviewing the principles of lifestyle medicine and in relevance to cancer survivorship and, and hope that you take away some tips and techniques for your own self-care. Next. So, uh, what is lifestyle medicine? Uh, lifestyle medicine is the therapeutic use of evidence-based lifestyle interventions to treat and prevent lifestyle-related diseases in clinical setting. Next. So how can this help our patients? Um, it helps patients improve quality of life, uh, improve side effects from treatment, improve physical function, mood, fatigue, and it can also improve cancer outcomes. Next. So there are six pillars to lifestyle medicine, um, exercise, uh, balanced nutrition, sleep, stress management, which is what we're gonna be covering today, social connections, and then avoiding risky substance use. Next. So my colleagues at the MGH Cancer Center are available for personalized lifestyle medicine consultations for patients who are uh, seeking to improve their well-being. Um, you will need a referral for this consultation and you can ask your provider for a referral to the lifestyle medicine consultation group. Next. 
So I'm going to be reviewing um, the stress physiology and, uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues who will demonstrate some specific mind-body medicine techniques. Um, so we know that obviously stress is a big part of our life and especially since COVID, it's really become a very big part of our lives, uh, whether we realize it or not. So what is the definition of stress? So stress is generally defined as a non-specific response to any demand. It can be to any major life events. Um, it can be obviously tragic events like loss of job, a divorce, but it can also be positive events like getting married, having children. Um, they can all be very stressful, certainly. Um, and then of course there's the chronic stress, which is the cumulative load of just our daily demands of life that deplete our coping resources. And, you know, stress doesn't always have to be bad, right? There's definitely the good stress. Um, certainly, like my son today for getting ready for his baseball game, it was very clear that he was a little stressed, um, wanted to do well. And it does, in those situations, help us keep focused, uh, but also really helps us rise to the challenge. But stress can become a problem when the demands of stress outweigh our ability to cope. And of course, uh, we know that stress can cause a lot of symptoms. It can cause various mental, physical changes in our body, but also affect our sleep and behavior. And, uh, and yes, stress can cause premature graying as well. Next. Um, so you all may be familiar with Walter Cannon's Fight or Flight. Um, so in 1920s, uh, Walter Cannon described a state of stress response, which is characterized by an overdrive of the sympathetic nervous system, also known as the adrenaline response, also or the fight or flight response. Generally, this is an involuntary response that comes on when we are, when we sense either a danger or even an imagined danger or a real, a physical danger. And typically those symptoms people experience, which I'm sure all of you have experienced at some point in your life, which is the tip, heart racing, your palms can get swelly, sweaty, your respiratory rate, your respirations can get very shallow, but also rapid. Um, and often, and obviously historically, this stress response was great to help us get out of harm's way. But in the modern times, we continue to activate the stress response even by negative thoughts, emotions, but also just watching the news these days. Next. So in, in this slide, um, the first picture of that brain um, is where the purple uh, is part of the brain is lit up. That is your prefrontal cortex, and that's the center that is um, more for sort of self-regulating behaviors. And that's the part of our brain that helps us to react in a rational way to stressors. So when we are um, practicing self-care tools that we will be going over and eliciting what we call the relaxation response, we are much more likely to be activating the prefrontal cortex first um, when, when we have a stressor. However, the second one uh, where it says under stress, um, that picture of the brain shows the amygdala, which is the bottom of the brain um, that is lit up. And that in chronic stress, what will happen is there are a lot of changes that take place in our brain that make the amygdala react activate first, which sets off a whole cascade of other physiological changes in our body, just as generally how we don't want to respond. Um, but the good news is that all these, a lot of these changes are reversible, and they're reversible through some mind-body medicine techniques that we're going to also go into in, in the later slides today. So next. So just a couple of definitions so we can understand the stress response. So allostasis is really an active process of adapting by which our body responds to daily events and stressors, but also to achieve this homeostasis, which is this balance. Whereas the allostatic load uh, when our bodies, when we are under that chronic stress response, when uh, we keep activating our stress response, our body works over time to manage our stress. And this results in that chronic wear and tear um, on, to our body and our brain. Next. 
So um, this slide, it's a little complicated to look at, but it, actually what it is, is summarizing is how we perceive stress. So individually, we all react differently to our stressors, but we also adapt differently to our stressors. So if you look at some individual differences, certainly some of the factors that cause the individual differences of how we perceive stress is our genetic makeup, our development, even our experiences in childhood as well as adulthood, but also our environmental stresses, which is what's going on at home, work, our neighborhood where we live. Um, and then of course, major life events will play a big role and also history of trauma and abuse. And um, what is really interesting is that our, the person's uh, state of general health will also predict on how well we adapt to these stressors. So really our behavioral responses of how we use uh, food or alcohol or even other substances as medications. So what can happen is when we're under that chronic stress, um, we just having that a rich diet or use of alcohol and tobacco, inadequate sleep will exacerbate the effects of the chronic st stress and, uh, and make it less able for us to adapt um, to our stressors. Next. So our stress responses mediators um, can affect various organ systems throughout our body, um, as it's shown on this slide. Uh, but generally, you'll see that when our autonomic nervous system is highly activated, uh, chronically, we can develop high blood pressure. Um, Acutely, we also see people come in with an increase in their pulse rate, uh, respiratory rate, and over time, definitely, this can affect our blood sugar and cause metabolic havoc. In fact, uh, chronic stress will keep your cortisol levels elevated, which can cause inflammation, affecting our immunity, and again, impairing our metabolic health. Next. So what is resilience? Resilience is really our ability to bounce back. And what characterizes um, um, resiliency really is in was when people are engaging in healthy lifestyle behaviors, but maintaining positive adaptive perspectives, positive social functioning, dialing up acceptance, which I have to say we have to use a lot of during COVID, um, and an appreciation, and tuning into energy boosters. And energy boosters could be anywhere from I took a walk at lunch today, or I spent time with my family, or I went to bed early because I wanted to get a good night's rest. Um, next. So these are our antidotes to stress. So definitely our mind-body therapy practices like meditation, yoga, tai chi, using prayer, acupuncture, acupressure, which we're gonna demonstrate later today. Um, and then of course, exercise, really any exercise, and uh, balanced nutrition, using positive emotions, support, relationships, extremely important, and, and sleep. I can't say enough about sleep. Um, I know I'm not a good person to be around when I don't have adequate sleep. Um, next. Um, so I love this cartoon. This is kind of what we are all in most of the time in our day when um, we're not being mindful. We're always planning, thinking, either we're in the future or we're in the past. Um, and, um, and usually our mind is up to no good when we're in these places. Next. So let's dig a little bit deeper um, into the mind-body interventions. Um, so some of you may be familiar with Dr. Herbert Benson. He's the founder of our institute at Benson Henry Institute at MGH. Um, and when in the 1970s, um, Dr. Benson coined the term, the relaxation response, which really is the opposite of the stress response. And when he described the relaxation response, he said, you know, this can be elicited by any sort of passive attention to either a focus, a sensation, or a repetition of a word or phrase or prayer. And the practice of eliciting this relaxation response helps to break that train of everyday thoughts. Next. So the relaxation response, it can be elicited, we know now, not just through meditation, which of course that is a, a fundamental practice, but uh, other practices like yoga, 
like acupuncture pressure and like Tai Chi and, and several other practices will also elicit the same relaxation response. And generally all you're trying to do is turn off that inner dialogue that we are constantly in. And the benefits of relaxation response can definitely be seen even with as little as having 15 to 20 minute practice once or twice a day. Um, you know, I talk, we talk about mini RRs a lot um, at the Benson Henry Institute. And, and generally when you think about when we're in the stress response, um, we, our muscles tend to be tighter. We also do a lot of shallow breathing throughout our day. And what's really nice about the mini relaxation response exercises is that you can constantly be buffering that stress response throughout the day by just taking some deep breaths or even doing some belly breaths. There are some really great YouTube videos um, for how to do those belly breathing. Um, so next. So what are the benefits of eliciting a regular uh, practice, having a regular practice of eliciting the relaxation response is that it helps to release tension in our muscles um, because our muscles tend to tighten up when we're under stress, um, but definitely deepens relaxation and it increases our emotional control and increases clarity of mind and as well as our ability to concentrate and definitely brings that feeling of having that oxygen in your, in your body, but also promotes good health and better sleep. Next. Um, so these mind-body techniques have been around for thousands of years. And uh, what about the science? And we definitely have a lot of scientific proof that shows that the mind can heal the body. We definitely have um, good data to show how stress impacts our chronic health. Uh, physically as well as mentally, and are affecting our immunity, of course. Um, but we also have data that shows that mind-body therapies can help our physiology. We have uh, studies to show that by eliciting the relaxation response and engaging in these mind-body therapies can reduce blood pressure, improve um, other physical symptoms like decreasing pain as well as changing our brain function. The one study that I've highlighted here is actually a really important study on epigenetics. In this particular study, they took a group of individuals who really hadn't did, did not have a practice of um, any sort of mind-body interventions and taught them over an eight-week period of how to elicit the relaxation response. And they were able to show that just by that training over eight weeks, they were able to change their gene expression. So we can't change our genetic makeup, our genes it's themselves, but we can absolutely change the activity. So we can change our gene expression and influence it for the positive and switch on the health promoting genes. Next. And then lastly, um, stress awareness. So we're, we're not always aware when we are under that stress response. We all have different sort of signals that our body gives us when we are under that stress response. Some of these signals may be physical, like the tension of the muscles, the heart racing. Some of them could be emotional, like feeling sadness, withdrawing socially, but they can also just be cognitive, like having the racing thoughts, or maybe not sleeping, but whatever the signals are, it's, it's really nice to be able to sort of recognize what your stress signals are. Oh, some people also overeat when they're under stress. And you know, when, I, when I'm talking to my patients, especially in weight management, it's, you know, I try to help them see that, you know, recognize where those signals are really coming in. And, and it invite them almost because they they can be an ally. It's kind of like a warning for you, right? That your body is under stress, and right now what you need is really the self care tools, maybe not the extra cookie. Um, so it's really important to build those coping resources and what those self care tools are going to be for you um, that will help to promote the positive emotions and other health promoting behaviors. And you know, try to engage with people or activities that really bring that pleasure for you. So with that, um, next um, I'm going to uh, pass it on to Nate and Lauren to share some mind body medicine techniques. Excellent. Thank you, Shalu, for a great presentation on the background of 
stress response. Um, and I'm here to take you through the first technique in mind-body medicine tonight um, that can really help to interrupt the stress response that um, happens in the body. And I'm gonna, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna show you how to do a little bit of acupressure that you can do on yourself at home um, that we uh, use a lot in practice to help um, with any sort of stress management overall. And so a lot of you may be familiar with acupuncture. You may have even had it. You know that it involves needles going into the body and it doing things. And acupressure is effectively the same thing as acupuncture. It just uses finger pressure instead of needles to um, achieve the same aims. And it's really easy to do um, in a self-care type of presentation. So before I get into the actual, the details and the points that I'm gonna show you tonight, I wanna give you a little bit of background into what we're doing at the hospital. Um, at all, and then also to give a little bit of history and some general technique about how to do this um, for yourselves. So I work in the Catherine A. Gallagher Integrative Therapies Program at the uh, MGH Cancer Center, and we offer acupuncture, massage therapy, music therapy, art therapy, yoga, and tai chi uh, free of charge to any patients that are receiving care in the cancer center. Um, and typically it's done through a referral, although there's a number of different um, ways to receive different types of services. So um, we can answer some more of that a little bit later on in the questions. Um, typically, we come in and we, we help with the, uh, managing the side effects of treatment. Often a side effect of receiving cancer treatment of any sort is stress management, um, since it tends to be a pretty uh, disrupting experience. Um, and patients report a lot of benefit from us coming in to help, not just provide them some care directly, but also teaching them some techniques to bring home with themselves, or bring home as well from the hospital. Typically, we cover both adult and pediatric units, and we work in outpatient and inpatient areas. However, the asterisk is there because COVID has obviously changed the whole situation. And so our offerings have changed a little bit, and so we will be hopefully getting back into our, you know, our full practice soon enough. But right now, we've had a little bit of change in how we're practicing, but we're, we're getting up and running, so we should be there soon. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to go into a little bit of brief history about acupuncture and acupressure and how they came about. And acupuncture and acupressure have been around a really long time. Um, the first cohesive medical record, uh, uh, excuse me, written history of the, the medical uh, um, practice of acupuncture was started around 300 to 100 BC. And it's been used pretty continuously in China ever since that period of time. And it actually spread throughout Asia with a number of countries actually developing their own styles and ev eventually developing and moving uh, throughout the world at this point. And what the Chinese um, focused on a lot was sort of investigating all of these surface points in the bodies that communicate with other areas of the body. So they typically had a local effect, but then they also noticed that there were connections to internal organs and also connections to areas that do not seem connected to those areas of the body. And over many thousands of years, they actually sort of, they actually um, use a lot of observational data to compile all that information. And that's the information that we use today to bring together um, personalized treatments for any patient that we see. And we'll see the next slide, actually, please. <clears throat> and so what you can see right now is um, sort of a map of the acupoints. And what you're looking at, um, the, the acupoints themselves are um, focused along particular areas of influence that are called meridians. Um, in English. And there are sort of all these connections of acupuncture points that move from the extremities towards the core of the body and um, influence various functions um, that have been attributed to them. Next slide, please. And so, as I said, when you come to see us for acupuncture or acupressure, we typically put together a combination of these points based on any particular complaints you have. And we're able to tweak them over time and to figure out the best combinations of points to actually address the particular concerns that you would have. So it's an interesting thing because it's a very individualized uh, form of healthcare. Um, and it is, as we see, kind of a living um, medicine because it helps to to sort of change with whatever's going on with the person, which is also really great, you know, as conditions change or as stress comes and goes in a person's life, we can, we can modify things for that. And um, as you see here, common complaints that we've seen are typically chronic in nature, um, although acute pain is something we very frequently treat, but uh, chronic pain is something that we treat an awful lot of. Obviously, any side effects of cancer treatment we, uh, we address, sleep disorders, menstrual complaints, digestive disorders, to name a few. Um, there are many other applications for acupuncture and acupressure. And I think it should be noted here as well that I think a lot of acupuncturists understand that stress tends to form a part of the picture of any 
particular thing that you're experiencing, because anything that, you, that is sort of changing the homeostasis in the body can be a stressful experience. And so all of us pretty well understand that we need to address stress one way or the other in order to actually help take you to the next level of health. And that usually forms uh, a part of what we're, uh, we're doing. And we'll use some of the points that I'm gonna show you tonight to actually address those, uh, that aspect, stress in health. Next slide, please. So when we're talking, getting down to the nitty gritty of acupressure for yourself, um, I think that's something that's really important um, that Shalu kind of mentioned, I think Lauren will also speak to as well, is about the sort of mind-body connection and mindfulness when actually approaching doing this type of activity. Um, you know, on a really basic level, you know, acupressure doesn't work unless you do it. And sort of maximizing the way that you can actually sort of help yourself out to remember, remember to do acupressure or to set up the scene in a way that actually feels really comfortable to do that is really important. So I always recommend finding some comfortable place in your house or even outdoors that feels really good to you where you can connect to something that's other than just your spinning mind. Um, so in the bath is great. Um, right before bed is a great time to do acupressure. If you wanna take a walk in the woods and stop off on a rock, that's also another great place to do it as well. Um, when you're actually doing the technique itself, um, you only need to use medium uh, or gentle pressure. Uh, what you really want to do is just engage the tissue enough to sort of create the response. I think sometimes, especially if you're super stressed out, there's a, a tendency to really like ratchet onto something and be like, I'm, I'm holding on for dear life. But um, we have a saying that there's no prize in pain. So I think that's something really important to remember that you just need something you need to show yourself kindness in this moment. And even like less is, less is more in these sorts of situations. Um, and you're gonna wanna think also ergonomically about how you're accessing these points as well. And I will go through the ergonomics of actually um, how to maximize um, the comfort when you're doing the, the points because ultimately you wanna sustain pressure on the points for a period of time. Usually one to two minutes is a pretty good uh, time to be holding onto the points. I think that, um, Momentary pressure doesn't quite do it. It's sort of the same as any sort of other stimulation your skin might be getting. And you want to actually really like engage that point and activate it in a way that the body knows what to do with it. And something that's really important as well is sort of the frequency of treatment as well. I think that uh, sometimes there's this idea that acupuncture and acupressure are this magic bullet and that it's a one, a one shot deal and that one treatment can cover all kinds of grounds. And really that's not very often the case. Really it's about the frequency of, of care. And I think that also in, in sort of going along with the ideas of mind-body medicine, we're also thinking about practices we can do for ourselves, routines we can create to actually help with sort of interrupt our stress response and remind us to actually do something for ourselves so that we can actually um, really just take care of ourselves and um, help out with our health. And so our typical recommendation for frequency would be around two to five times per week. Once a week is also fine. Um, having guilt about not doing acupressure also doesn't work for health outcomes. So it's really about just doing what you can do and it's okay, no matter what it is. Next slide, please. And I just wanna make a quick disclaimer, um, especially for those of you that are undergoing cancer care at present, um, there are a couple um, things to watch out for. Typically acupressure is a super safe activity. We actually say um, the biggest side effect from acupressure is relaxation. Uh, so that's actually, um, one of the great benefits of doing this. Um, but there are some actually some really specific things that are going on um, that are particularly specific for cancer patients that I just wanna go over really quick. So any limb that has um, an IV or a PICC line inserted into it, you do not wanna do acupressure on that limb. We don't wanna dislodge anything that has actually happened there because you're gonna need that for care and we don't wanna undo anything going on there. So even if you happen to go inpatient, for example, to get chemotherapy, um, we wouldn't want, even if you're feeling stressed about it, I don't want you to do any acupressure on that limb um, that you've had access just so that we don't sort of mess up what's going on. Um, also, if you have any new swellings, discolorations, or pain, something that might be a concern for a clot in the limb, um, or if you actually have a known clot in the limb, we want to avoid that limb. Do not do any pressure on that limb whatsoever. That needs to be addressed medically. Um, and then we also typically say, um, if you've been told that you have low platelets, it's best not to do acupressure in that time period. Um, there's a certain threshold um, for platelets that might be lower that we are able to do acupressure in, but unless you have the details about how to actually go about doing acupressure in that kind of a scenario, we don't want you to actually go ahead and do that for yourselves. Let, let one of the other professionals do that. 
Um, I do want to note though that if you are on blood thinners, which is a big question we get, it is okay to do acupressure as long as your levels are being controlled and that everything is, is pretty stable. If it's not well controlled, if you know there's some instability in your clotting, then you're going to want to avoid acupressure until the stability is maintained. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to get onto some points. So I'm going to show you three points today. And the first one, um, I'll actually to back up quickly, all of these are really easy to access. Um, you don't have to twist or contort into any sort of um, odd positions for these. These are going to be easy to do in a number of different types of scenarios because really, again, it's about being able to do this as opposed to just wishing that you could do it. So the first point here is what we call large intestine four. So this is on the large intestine meridian, which goes from the finger up into the face and connects with the large intestine organ. And um, this is one of the big 10, 10 star points in acupuncture. We use this point all the time. Um, and you can see on the picture on the left, this is where the location is at. It's kind of on the meaty area of the back of the hand between the index finger and the thumb. And the easiest way to find it is actually on the right, which is you simply bring your thumb towards your index finger. And that meaty area of the muscle is actually gonna form a hill. And at the high point of the hill is where you're going to actually find the point. And then you just relax your hand where you find that point and then you'll be right on it. Next slide, please. And so here's an actual, some visuals about how you can hold the point. Um, it's really easy to do either with your thumb or your index finger. Um, so you're gonna sort of hold on with the thumb or the index finger. And then what is gonna be important is that on both of the pictures, you're supporting actually from behind in, on the palm of the hand to sort of um, provide some counter pressure against that point, um, just so that it's more comfortable, especially if you're gonna be holding it for one to two minutes. Because sort of like, if you're just pressing like this, it's hard to sort of maintain stable pressure, but if you hold it like this, it's actually gonna, hold, it's gonna maintain um, more stability in the pressure. Um, and obviously all these points are gonna be great for stress. This is probably one of the big pain points. If you come in for pain with a pain complaint, we're gonna definitely do this point probably more often than not, um, which also makes it great for headaches and other uh, many, many other types of complaints. Um, next slide, please. And then the next point is on the pericardium channel. It's called pericardium eight. And so the pericardium channel runs from the middle finger up the inside of the arm, up towards the chest. And so I have two points on the picture on the left that sort of uh, show what's going on here. So the center X is actually a, a visual reference for where the center of the palm is. So you're gonna see that the point is actually not located directly at the center of the palm. It's gonna be slightly diagonal towards the index finger. And the way you're gonna find it is actually on the right. And what you'll do is make a loose fist. And where the middle finger actually hits the palm is where you're gonna find that point. And again, it's not gonna be directly in the center of the palm, it's gonna be diagonally towards the index finger as you see there. So you can do the next slide, please. And this, um, and so here's some more techniques on holding it. It's easier to do with your thumb, to do the thumb pressure there. And on the right side, you can see how you would hold um, for the counter pressure on the back of the hand so that you can have the sustained pressure on that one. This is uh, great for stress, as I said. Um, it's also a big point for anxiety and insomnia, and especially insomnia related to anxiety or stress for like the squirrel brain that won't let you go to sleep. Um, this is a fantastic point to do as you're laying in bed if you're really just like, well, I want it shut off. I just want to go to bed. Give it a whirl, see how this works. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really great point. It's actually much more comfortable to do with pressure than needles. So you can do yourself a favor and, and do, some, do some pressure on it. And next slide, please. And so I'm gonna go to actually the last point that I'm gonna show you today, which is, uh, which we call Yin Tong. It's a very grandiose title is Hall of Impressions, um, which we never use because it's a little wordy for our, <laughs> our note taking. Um, but this is located at what would traditionally be called the third eye point, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, it has a lot of sort of similar correlations to the idea of the third eye and of sort of, sort of mind-body connection and sort of deeper understanding of the, the mind and the spirit. Um, and it's pretty easy to find overall, is that you're just going to look right, so basically when you feel on your forehead, you're just going to feel where both of your eyebrows end on the, the inner portion of that. And it doesn't matter where they end, you'll just find the ending there and you just split the difference and find the middle spot and that's where the actual point is gonna be located. And sort of as a side note, being hyper specific about the location of these points is not absolutely necessary. As long as you kind of like get in the right neighborhood, these will still have some effect for you as well. Uh, and I'll show you, so this might feel like a little weird to try to do pressure on. So I'll, we'll go to the next slide and I'll sort of 
illustrate some better techniques here. Um, obviously, in a time of COVID, uh, models are hard to come by, so I had to use myself as a model, so if it looks a little bit weird, my apologies. Um, but what we have here is um, on the center and on the left side, uh, pictures, what we have is that I actually have my head supported with a pillow, and the pillow is going to is going to actually uh, um, apply the counter pressure for the technique. Um, so you don't actually have to worry about trying to stabilize your head with your neck, uh, which can be kind of tiring. And especially if you have any neck or back pain, it can also induce a bit of pain, which is not any good. So if you want to lay down on the couch, lay down in bed, um, and just rest your head on a pillow, this will apply plenty of force to um, to sort of help with the pressure. And as I show on the left, you can use your thumb to um, apply the pressure, or you can actually use any one of your fingers that feels most comfortable um, as well. Probably pinky less so, but sometimes, you know, that actually might feel good too. So uh, the choice is yours, um, but you can use any one of your fingers to actually apply the pressure with that. And if you don't have the ability to, to lay down, or if you're just feeling stressed at work and you're sitting at your desk and you're like, oh my God, I need to like just, bring it in for a second. Um, what I have is on the right is I actually have my arm uh, braced on, in this case, the arm of the sofa, but it's really easy to brace on a tabletop or on any other sort of surface that's about that level. And you're going to just stabilize your arm on that surface. And then you can actually press your head into the thumb as opposed to pushing the thumb back into the head. And that will offer more stability and will not be as evocative pain-wise. Um, if that's part of the picture as well. So this is probably our number one relaxation point of all. Um, it bears the, um, the moniker, uh, the vacation point oftentimes, because this is usually the, one of the first points we put in when we do acupuncture treatments. Uh, people often come back uh, reporting where they went on vacation to at the end of their acupuncture treatment, because sometimes they go to Aruba, sometimes they go to Australia, sometimes they go to Japan. I've had people go all kinds of places during treatments, and it's usually this point that has some sort of um, some sort of impact in that. Um, also, locally, it, it also addresses sinus issues and headaches, uh, but vacations are better. So uh, this is why it figures into most of our uh, our treatments. And that brings us pretty much to the end of my section. We'll just go to the last slide here, um, and I just want to sort of I just want to stress that acupressure is really easy to do for yourself. This is a really great way to support your own stress response in terms of not just doing the pressure on yourself, but also creating the space to actually note the changes that are happening in your body. And um, I just want to um, highlight a couple things here really quick. Um, we've made a number of um, support videos as well that are available on the Mass General. Uh, hospital cancer center site um, on YouTube. There's a channel. And if you just scroll through uh, a number of the videos, there's a bunch of videos for stress management um, in the time of COVID. And we have some videos on acupressure demonstrations, yoga, and massage that can help with stress response. And I believe that um, we'll be sending out an email with some resources at the end of this um, presentation for all the participants as well. So you can follow the link from there. But anyway, thank you all for your time and I appreciate it. I'm going to send it off to Lauren now. Thank you so much, Nate. I feel so much less stress after <laughs> doing a couple of those points during your talk. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about, um, well, actually, before I do that, um, thank you, Yael, for putting up this slide. This, um, I just, we just wanted to include a screenshot of um, how to access the wellness services that we have in the Cancer Center. Um, so this is highlighting the calendar, which will show you day by day what classes are available, um, all of which right now are virtual, that you can sign on and do from the comfort of your own home. You'll see yoga, music therapy, which we highlighted two weeks ago in our lifestyle medicine series. Um, there, there are a multitude of classes available that you can access, and this website will give you more information about the treatments and services that we offer. And we'll include that, I think, in an email at the end, so you'll have that link. So my talk will be, um, I'll begin by talking about meditation for self-care. Um, and so I, I wanted to include this slide to show that there are many, many forms and figures and images that might come to mind when we think about meditation. But um, probably in the upper 
um, left corner, at least for me, looking at this screen, um, the image of you know someone sitting up on a hilltop overlooking a beautiful scene in the most serene bliss is, is seems so completely unattainable. But that's oftentimes the image that comes to mind when one maybe hasn't tried meditation, that that's just impossible, so why bother? Um, and I just love the, the child in the middle because this just suggests that in fact, anyone can do yoga, even a little child, not yoga, but a meditation. Um, the two children are just doing it without really any judgment on themselves whatsoever, that it could be associated with the yoga practice. You see the women on the mat there. Meditation could be a, a moving meditation outside in the woods, just connecting with the surroundings rather than the, the goings on of the mind, and, or even something you know like a, a running a marathon or a race where you're just thinking about breath and movement. Um, but again, that there's no right or wrong about how meditation should look. Next slide, please. And so it is quite an ancient practice. As with Nate's presentation, it's almost impossible to talk about the history of an ancient practice that's over 5,000 years old. <laughs> um, so I won't. But just to, just to name where these practices originated, so meditation is dated back to the Indian subcontinent, 5,000 BCE, we think, um, but was recorded um, um, in probably the 1500s, uh, evidence of meditation practices um, described in the Indian text called the Vedas. Um, in, in the 1700s is when the West uh, or the Europeans um, became aware of yoga through translating um, Eastern philosophy texts to different European languages. Um, in the 1920s, much later um, is when we uh, began to learn about yoga uh, and meditation in the United States. Uh, Swami Vivekananda and Paramah Paramahansa Yogananda traveled to the US from India and shared the practices here. Um, and so also important to note that, that meditation, um, all, all re religious practices, all major religions practice some form of meditation, but it's not necessarily or doesn't need to be religious at all. It's really considered a spiritual practice. And you'll see down the bottom, I have images here of the, um, the Lord Ganesh on the left, which is a Hindu god of beginnings on the right, the Buddha. Um, again, um, common images, but uh, not necessarily required to have that again that that connotation um, now of course meditation has become increasingly popular according to a cdc study in 2017 approximately 14 percent of adults in the u.s of the population practice yoga and about the same pop, uh, percentage meditate and i would guess in the setting of covid that many more perhaps have at least become aware of or practice some form of meditation and yoga with some of that free time. Next slide, please. So um, just to understand a bit about what's going on when, when one is meditating, Shalu uh, reviewed in great depth for all of us the, um, the sort of physiologic response um, that occurs, but just again to emphasize the um, importance of the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system with meditation. That is what we understand is, is going on, which is the relaxation response in the body, reducing heart rate, stimulating digestion, improving sleep and well-being. Um, and we also believe um, it, may, it may help with pain signals as well. There's a cascade effect on several body systems. Again, this would be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, as I listed here, I think, again, sort of pertinent to the cancer population, this, the effects on the immune system, that there's been evidence to show improvement in cell-mediated immunity, as well as reducing inflammatory markers. And then also the impact on mental health, that it's shown to reduce anxiety, depression, and insomnia. Um, some research has also um, uh, suggested a small to moderate reduction in stress, and that's probably um, 
I would say it's arguable. <laughs> um, and then as, as well as shown changes in the brain. And then of course we know meditation can help to reduce physical tension. Um, next slide, please. So the um, NCCIH uh, describes four, element, four elements of meditation. Um, and these are sort of the four key factors that are helpful to have in place when you choose to meditate. The first is having a quiet location. <laughs> That's helpful um, so that you're not distracted. Um, the second is a comfortable posture. And I just want to emphasize again, this is not me to appear like the folks on the right, a cross-legged seat, a cross -legged position sitting on the ground that may be uncomfortable for many of us. So maybe it's your chair, maybe it's your bed, maybe it's standing up, maybe it's walking. It just has to be comfortable, it depends on you. The focus, um, a focus of attention, that's pretty important to having something to draw your attention on. So that could be a word or a phrase, object or objects. It could be physical sensations or your breath. Um, and finally, probably most importantly, that you go into it without a judgment, without any judgment on yourself. Just be completely open to the practice, whatever comes up, um, and just noticing when you're judging and then let it, let it pass without engaging in it. Please, next slide. So um, again, there are many, many techniques of meditation, too many to go into in this talk, ranging from simple to complex. Um, and I list a couple of them here. What I'd like to focus on tonight is mindful movement. Um, AKA yoga. And that is the attention to the body and the sensory experience combined. So it really brings in the physical practice, which can be a helpful point of focus. Next slide, please. So, um, so yoga, yoga, san the Sanskrit root of the word yoga is Y-U-J or Yuj. And that means to join or to unite, um, uniting the individual consciousness with the universal consciousness, which seems like a really big concept. Um, you could probably pare it down to the bind-body connection, as we've been talking about all night, or body, mind, and nature. Um, and it's an activity or a process that allows you to go beyond automatic thinking, similar to acupressure or a breath practice into a more grounded state. So the key components are that it's meditative, there's a focus on your breath, and that there's postures that you do in some sort of sequence with some repetition. Um, next slide, please. Um, so not to go into too much of this, because I know we're running short on time, but just to know that there's that yoga is one of the most popular complementary um, modalities in with amongst patients with cancer in the United States. Um, there's quite a bit of, of research now supporting yoga during and also after cancer treatment, but I would just add a caveat that most of the studies um, that were done were pr primarily of cohorts Caucasian and female, so we need more research um, involving, um, you know, men, women, and um, different age groups, as well as di diverse, a diverse group of, of men and women. Um, but most of the research did include all stages of cancer and most cancer types. Um, and in most cases, in the during cancer treatment research, um, chemotherapy and or radiation was what the patients were undergoing. You can see quite a variety of benefits of yoga um, were incurred by, by those who, who were participating in the studies, um, mainly improvements in mental health, physical quality of life, fatigue, um, things that seem fairly obvious. And But most importantly, that none of the research studies seem to show any downside or any adverse events from practicing yoga in the cancer population. Um, Further, the, um, the, the, for survivors, for cancer survivors specifically, the body of research is small but growing. So we are seeing more and more research, um, which is great. The demographics are still limited, but hopefully that will improve with time. And again, the improvements around mental health, self-esteem, which was interesting in the cancer survivorship population, and concentration, which is all, often a big complaint amongst patients that I talk with with breast cancer. Um, 
are, are all good benefits. Um, and I would just add that while um, yoga is safe for cancer patients, per the research, most of the research done were using very gentle practices under a lot of supervision, et cetera. So it's important that the practice be mindful and gentle and that you start slow with anything that you try that's new and that you work with experienced teachers. Next slide, please. Um, so types of yoga that you, you might consider trying, some tips um, that therapeutic yoga is likely safer than a general, commu general uh, community type class, although again, that may vary depending on what's available in your community. And you also, um, one needs to consider individual factors, of course. Uh, level of fitness varies, stamina, frailty, tolerance to heat injuries, and also treatment side effects, effects and complications should all kind of be a part of the recipe in terms of what yoga practice you might choose. Um, you'll always want to talk to your teacher ahead of class, introduce yourself, and, um, and please do divulge anything you wish them to know. They will not be able to read your mind or your body like an x-ray. So um, it is helpful. As, as a yoga teacher myself, it is helpful to know um, what folks are working with so that you can work with them. Um, another great, great, great thing to add to your practice is the use of props. Props bring the floor to you. So whether it's a chair or bolster, blankets, pillows, um, if you're working with, again, an experienced teacher, they can help you with these types of things so that you're, again, comfortable. That's the key with yoga. Um, then you get to the other stuff like the bliss on the mountain part. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you want to maximize benefit and minimize the harm. There's no studies that are showing contraindications to yoga, but again, it's with a mindful practice. That's really, really important. There are many, many different postures that may be unsafe for certain conditions. Again, it's a long laundry list. I couldn't even make it a slide. Um, but any, almost any practice can be modified. So it doesn't mean that yoga is not for you. It just matters what type of yoga and how you're practicing if you have any particular condition. Um, so I think we have unfortunately run out of time to practice yoga, but the great news is you can go on the MGH Supportive Care website tomorrow and look and see when the next class that wonderful, wonderful Luba Zagation, our cancer center yoga therapist is going to be offering virtually. Um, most days of the week she's offering class so you can take a class for free which I'm sure you'll enjoy much more than at the end of a long talk. So namaste, and thank you all. And we're gonna entertain some questions now. So I'm gonna take a look at the chat or the Q&A and see if any questions have come up. Um, the first question is, can the presentation be sent out to the attendees after this session? And yes, we will be um, sending out references, I believe, and the presentations themselves will be available actually on the MGH Lifestyle Medicine website. You can also view the prior presentations. Um, so that's fantastic. So get on our website and you'll be able to view the presentation. Um, the second question is, what are your thoughts on meditation apps and which would you recommend? Um, I, would, I can speak from personal experience, and I'd love to hear if anybody else is using one, but I like Headspace currently. I've used others in the past, but that's just what I've been working this year. Um, I like that one. I don't always like to rely on an app, but there's, of course, many different um, meditations out, out, out there, like Calm and Insight Timer, and like I mentioned, Headspace. Uh, does anyone have any other favorites? Do you guys use a meditation app in the panel? I, I definitely think the Insight Timer is beautiful. Um, a lot of our patients uh, give us really positive feedback for that. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And I actually, um, I don't tend to use guided meditations myself, but I actually really like using some sort of like sort of calming music. And actually what we've used a lot for even acupuncture sessions that also promotes like a meditative environment is an app called Bloom. And I think it was actually developed by Brian Eno, um, the, com the musical composer. And oh. it's sort of, uh, it's very, it's kind of like a, it's a little chimey, but it sort of is not, nothing is too harsh sounding and it sort of goes through various tones. And I think it's a really nice meditative. That's great. Well, maybe what we can do is put a list of some of our faves on the um, email that will go out to participants after the session. Um, so let's see. 
Um, here's a question. Who could give me the referral to the integration therapies, the oncologist or the, the, oncologist or the social worker? Nate, would you like to take that I'd one? I'd love to take that one. So the easiest way to get uh, the complete referral to um, the integrative therapies is to actually speak to either your, uh, your oncologist or to your nurse practitioner. Um, they can put in an order for that. And depending on, you'll, you'll need to actively be in treatment. And because everything's a little bit in flux right now, we'll definitely do our best uh, to um, sort of find where you're going to be within the hospital in order to link you with the services. But we need to start with the order from your, your oncologist or from your nurse practitioner. And um, you can just ask them at, your, at the next visit and they can put in that order for you. Um, and then I think we'll probably include the contact information for um, our program in the materials that go out. And it will actually give you the, the main line to our, our um, patient navigator. And she can also give you further information about the details of which services you might be interested in and how to get those going. It's one of my favorite things to do, by the way, refer to integrative therapies. <laughs> Lauren's great at it. <laughs> Um, let's see. I think we have run out of time. Um, so again, thank you all. I'm going to ask everyone to say a, a quick goodbye to all of you as well. So I'll pass the mic over to Nate and Shalu. Excellent. Well, thank you all for attending. It's really great to see everybody here and we hope that it provides you some, uh, some good resources for stress management. Thank you all. That was really wonderful. And uh, I hope that you can take some self-care tools tonight. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you to our awesome panelists for such a thought-provoking presentation. We hope we'll see you guys next week for our capstone presentation, the last one as part of this series. Uh, have a great week. <laughs>